Welcome to the second part of our Blood Flagellates Lecture. Our topic for this afternoon, for this session, is African trypanosoma. And the bad news is, human African trypanosomiasis is still present even during these times as part of the neglected tropical diseases. Now, there are 36 countries in sub-Saharan Africa which is still affected by the particular disease. And as you can see, the distribution is here. Okay, let's try to identify them. Now, a big chunk will be coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Then you have all these different um, countries. Um, the good news is we are eyeing to have this particular um, disease eliminated as a public health concern by 2020, according to the WHO. We received reports of fewer and fewer cases throughout the years. And as you can see here, 20 years ago, there were a lot of um, people being affected by the disease. While 10 years ago, there's a gradual decline. And uh, just a few years ago, there's a big change in the number of new cases being reported. Now let's talk about the causative agent for African trypanosomiasis. Now, in other journals, you'll see that it is labeled human African trypanosomiasis, or HAT. Now, the causative agent for this disease is a protozoan parasite of the genus trypanosoma. Please take note of the parts of a typical trypanosoma. You have an undulating membrane here covering one side of the body, this one here, the wavy thing, the wavy thing. You have your kinetoplast here, somewhere in the posterior end, and you have a centrally located nucleus here. You, also ha uh, you can also appreciate a terminal flagellum, a single flagellum on the anterior end of your trypanosome. Now, you have two basic species of human African trypanosomes that you need to worry about. The first one is your Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense, and it's found somewhere in the east and south, uh, southern parts of Africa. Now, if you take note of the species name, Rhodesia is actually the former name for Zimbabwe, which is somewhere in the south southeast of Africa. And this corresponds, this particular species here, corresponds to around less than 2% of all uh, human African, African trypanosomiasis cases. While the second species is Trypanosoma brucei gambiense, and this is predominant in West and Central Africa. Now, this particular species is responsible for a majority of the cases, or greater than 98% of all the cases. And Gambia is in the western edge of Africa. A third species, your Trypanosoma brucei brucei, is a significant parasite, but this usually affects cattle. And this cattle disease is called, in Africa, it's called Nagana. The vector for African trypanosomiasis is called your tsetse fly. That's how you pronounce it. It's a tsetse fly. And you get the disease by the fly biting you. So it's a biting fly of the genus Glossina. This particular fly um, bites during the daytime. Both the males and the females uh, would actually bite humans. The adults can grow up to around 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters long, so it's, it's quite long. And the parasites mature in the salivary glands, and vertical transmission and accidental needle prick injuries can also transmit the particular parasite. There are several reservoir hosts identified for human trypanosomes, like dogs, pigs, cattle, and wild animals. But these are more predominant for the Rhodesiense type. Now, the Gambiense type of trypanosomes, um, they only have humans as a significant reservoir host. This is the life cycle of your African trypanosomes. And let's start discussing the life cycle. As the TT fly bites humans, it injects a metacyclic trypomastigal. So please take note of that. I'll try to highlight it here. You have your metacyclic trypomastigote. Then these transform into the bloodstream as bloodstream trypomastigotes. So bloodstream trypomastigotes. Then, then your bloodstream trypomastigotes undergoes several, a lot of stages of binary fission where they would 
um, divide and reproduce asexually as multiple bloodstream trypomastigotes. And that is how they multiply inside the body. And from there, they will be able to reach the different parts of the body. Now, we're all left with your bloodstream trypomastigotes over here. And, of course, since they are circulating in blood, once another TT fly bites you, then it would ingest a bloodstream trypomastigote. And inside a vector, it would undergo this addition, these additional steps in its development, eventually forming another metacyclic trypomastigote, which is situated in the salivary glands of your TT fly. So as the TT fly again bites another person, that person gets infected by metacyclic trypomastigotes. Now please please take note that the specific type procyclic trypomastigotes are not seen in the human in humans. However, they are only seen in the vector. Please also take note that there are no amastigote stages for your human African trypanosomes compared to your Leishmania. Now, I wanted to mention that while there is well-documented asexual reproduction amongst protists, including your trypanosomes, there has been evidence of genetic exchange going on, but this usually, according to studies, they usually happen inside a vector, and it's not recorded inside your uh, inside a human host. We mentioned the different species of African trypanosomes. You have your Gambiense and your Rhodesiense. Your Trypanosoma Gambiense infections tend to progress more slowly over several years and are less severe compared with your Rhodesiense. So you have your chronic infection for Gambiense versus acute infection, acute meaning, meaning several weeks to several months to develop. Okay. So, chronic cases occur in Gambiense, and the problem here is that the chronic cases serve as reservoir or, or seeds of further epidemics, and this is according to studies. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, humans are the primary hosts for your Gambiense infections, while your animals, even domesticated animals, can be reservoir hosts for Rhodesiense. As far as the vectors are concerned, Please take note that the Glucina species, which transmit the Gambiense infection, they usually thrive in humid and watery or the river environment, hence the water in Gumbi, while the Glucina species uh, tend to thrive in hot, dry, desert, savanna type environments, hence the desert here in the roadsters. By the way, this uh, picture here is from Mad Max Fury Road. Please watch that. There are three phases of infection for human African trypanosomiasis. You have your initial, your early, and your late phase. Initial phases can also be is also called your chancro formation stage. Early phase is called your hemolymphatic phase, and your late phase is your meningoencephalitic phase. During the initial phase, you have a well circumscribed, painful, and a pruritic chancre which eventually develops into an eschar, and this is due to the bite site of your TT fly. However, this chancre resolves roughly around two to three weeks, and after a few days, the early phase begins. The early phase is described as the phase where there, are, there is parasitic proliferation, there is systemic distribution of your parasite, and this particular early phase can last for one to six months, depending on the species of the trypanosome. And during this phase, the parasite exhibits or creates immunogenic variant surface glycoproteins. Please take note of this VSG, this, because this is a primary mode of evasion from the human immune system. The last phase is characterized by involvement of the central nervous system of the host. Now, in Gambian infections, this occurs roughly around after 3 to 10 months, while in Rhodesian infections, it can occur as early as a few weeks from the initial infection. During the hemolymphatic phase, the symptoms can be as follows. You have relapsing fever, headache, malaise, anemia, joint and muscle pains. And there is 
an enlarged posterior cervical lymph node formation. This one here. And this is called a winter bottom sign. For the meningoencephalitic phase, of course, you'd expect behavioral changes. You'd expect central nervous system symptoms such as headaches, sleep pattern changes, even confusion, speech defects. There is also this symptom here, a deep delayed bilateral hyperesthesia, which is called your Carandel sign. And what does it mean? Your Carandel sign is due to demyelination of your neurons. And this is due to cross-reactivity of the antibodies against the trypanosomes um, to galactocerebroside, which is a component of your myelin sheet. As you can see here, if left untreated, this particular disease eventually progresses to a comatose state, eventually leading to death. Please take note that both Gambian and Rhodesian um, human African trypanosomiasis would cause a meningoencephalitic phase and would progress to death if not treated appropriately. However, we mentioned earlier, a Gambian infection would progress slower while a Rhodesian infection would progress rather quickly. And since it progresses to a coma, which eventually leads to death, this the particular disease is called your African sleeping sickness. Hence the sleeping beauty picture at the start of the slides. Now, the pathophysiology involving uh, human African trypanosomiasis would be primarily immune-mediated hypersensitivity. And this is due to particular inflammatory mediators as listed here. However, we'll not discuss them in detail. But these mediators act on the RBCs, on brain, and on heart tissues, which eventually leads to, it is termed your acute hemorrhagic mucoencephalopathy, wherein there are numerous small and in places confluent foci of hemorrhage throughout the brain stem. So this is a biopsy of a brain stem. This table over here from one study by McLean et al. in 2012, I think. This shows that neurologic signs, I'll try to highlight it here, neurologic signs appear even in the early stages, as you can see here. However, the difference is that a moderate GCS depression of GCS less than 12 is only seen in late stages. So this can be a good uh, gauge uh, if you have a patient with a GCS score of less than 12, then most probably that patient is already in the meningoencephalitic stage. How do you diagnose African sleeping sickness? As with most parasites, you have to see them to be able to 100% be sure that that particular parasite is present. Direct visualization is still the gold standard and you can use the chancre fluid, blood lymph node asp aspirates, cerebrospinal fluid to try to um, detect the highly motile trypomastigotes being obscured by my logo. But these ones here, oh, wait, these ones over here would be the trypanosomes. And this is a blood smear. Now, in the field setting, you can't do um, microscopy all of the time. Um, in the field, they've been using cardagglutination test for trypanosomes or CAT, and this is use useful for screening, but only for the Gambian form. Now, there's no comparable test for the Rhodesian form, unfortunately. This is rapid and very specific. It's used to detect the presence of your trypanosome antigens in a particular sample in the field. So how do you treat African sleeping sickness? Now, the treatment of African sleeping sickness depends on several factors. Number one, the stage of the disease that is present. And number two, of course, the species of your human African trypanosome. For the hemolymphatic phase, you use pentamidine for early stage Gambian infections. And you use suramin 
for the early stage Rhodesian sleeping sickness. For the meningoencephalitic or the late phase, we use melarsoprol for both forms of sleeping sickness. Now, this cosmetic drug, which was initially used as facial cream, or at least a component of facial creams, was found to have a side effect of curing African sleeping sickness. And this drug is called eflornithine. Now, this is called a resurrection drug. This is the current first-line drug for Gambian sleeping sickness who do not respond to melarsoprol treatment. There are several studies which utilizes a combination of eflornithine and nifortimox as a safer and as effective drug combinations in the treatment of human African trypanosomiasis. But how do you prevent and control African sleeping sickness? Surveillance of atris populations is one strategy. The biggest successes that they've found in Africa in the control and prevention of African sleeping sickness is vector control. And we know that tsetse fly is a primary vector for African sleeping sickness. And when you control their breeding grounds or when you try to call their numbers, you can control the prevalence of your African sleeping sickness. This is an example of, these are examples of fly traps that they've used to collect a sustainable number of uh, TT flies to try to control the prevalence of the disease. This is a swinger trap. What it does is it swings back and forth and it collects TT flies in the process. Based on my earlier slides, these control measures are somewhat effective in at least decreasing the number of the disease. Okay, so that's it for African trypanosomiasis or human African trypanosomiasis or African sleeping sickness. Thank you for watching and watch out for the third installment of Blood Flagellates. Peace.